Hi, everyone. Welcome to lecture 10. Uh, just one second. All right, so let's begin with the quiz. So I'm gonna set the quiz up. All right, so let's begin the quiz. Um, three minutes. Are you seeing the screen? Okay, by the way, so, okay. I'm gonna share the slides, the link to the slides too. Okay, so please make sure to participate in the quiz. That will be your attendance. But I'll leave it open until the um, we get to the uh, end of the recap. And um, a few announcements. So sorry for the delay. 
assignment two was supposed to be available last week, but yeah, I was sick and uh, it took me some time to actually um, upload it, but now it's up, it's up on the website. So please check it out. And because I was late, apparently, of course, um, it will be due in two weeks from today, not from last week. So at least you have the same time to work on it. And I think maybe I'm making a justification, but it could be better for you because it will not be due in the middle of the midterms. So next week's midterm, right? And the final project survey is due today. So it only takes five minutes. So please make sure to submit it. Otherwise, we, will, we might have to go through a really, um, you know, I mean, the point here is that I want to make sure what you're working on is final project submittable. And at the end, you might turn out it might turn out that your what you're working on might not be applicable for the final project. So you want to actually make sure to submit this as soon as possible. Of course, if you're working on final project, but actually if you're not, even if you're not, please go to the survey and then say that you're not, you're, you're not going to work on it. You're gonna just submit four assignments. And note that next week is midterm week. So we have no lectures. Good luck with your midterms. All right, let's begin with the lecture nine recap. So we began last class with the outline of um, our roadmap this semester. So actually, it's been about six weeks and we covered a lot relatively. We, we, we actually now know how to do tax classification and token classification and also retrieval. And now we're moving to tax generation. And that means that we need more tools from the model side, not just RNNs, but we need new things. And we're going to talk about today in quarter decoder and attention. I mean, in Core Decoder, we talked about it last class, right? But then we have a bit left off to finish it. And of course, by doing so, we are able to do text generation tasks such as machine translation and language model, these two. So summarization actually is another example of text generation. So in this case, you're given a uh, really long document and you're trying to generate short summary. And we discussed that there could be two ways to approach this. One is extractive, which means that usually extractive and at the level of sentence, you're indicating whether each sentence should be included in the final summary or not. You can, I, you can make it more abstractive or generative, which means you generate the output summary. So in this case, your output summary might not be having overlap with your input news or document. So this becomes a text generation problem as opposed to the token or text classification problem in the extractive case. And machine translation is obvious. We want to generate the, in the output space like Korean, given the English input. And one of uh, really the difficulties we discussed last lecture is that the fact that text classification is relatively straightforward when you're defining the loss because you can just use a simple maximum likelihood estimation. It's doable because there are only few possible classes or labels and basically which means you can create your target and your prediction probability without any problem, right? And then you can just compute the cross entropy. But then text generation becomes much more difficult because in text classification, you only had like a few options. If you're classifying sentiments, it's either positive or negative. But if you are generating text, then you have so many options. You have so many possible outputs, which means you cannot enumerate all of them 
of course you can try to suppose that your length is fixed to be t say 32 and you're given vocab size of v this can be easily like uh, 10,000 20,000 then your text space is v to the power of t and v being for instance um what was it 10,000 and then let's say the length of t was 32 this is equivalent to actually 10 to the power of 96, right? Because this is 10 to the power of three and 32. And how large is this number? I think I've said this a few times just to give you an idea. It's bigger than the number of atoms in the universe. So it's too large. I mean, you cannot even really enumerate all of them. So creating a maximum likelihood estimation, exact MLE in text generation is impossible, practically. So what we usually do is that we can try to define um, MLE via conditional probabilities. For instance, um, like uh, by defining P of Y given X as the multiplication of these different probabilities. And note that this e e equality is always true. There is no assumption made about it. It's exactly equal. It does the bias rule. But what actually becomes different is that whether you're modeling each probability correctly. And because when you're training, you're actually obtaining the each distribution or you're training for each distribution independently. That's why it's, it's not exactly MLE when you're talking about the original probability distribution, the target probability distribution. So independently, you can create MLE, that's fine. But then this won't be MLE. So there is a really important distinction between those two. So when the sequence length is one, it's straightforward. It's actually very similar to V-way classification. And simple approach would be just to use last hidden state of LSTM for the classification. You did this for your homework assignments. So pretty straightforward. It's just that now, instead of classifying this into two labels or two classes, you're classifying this into V-way classification where V is a very large number. What if T equal two? Well, the the first conditional probability can be identical, but then how about the second conditional probability? It's, you have to actually create a second MLE. And the, the issue is that when you have, a, I mean, it's impossible to actually have, um, you cannot, so actually I will get to, get, get to this later actually, not now, but then the point is that you want to, now you have a way of um, creating, I mean, turning this one um, P of Y given X into multiplication of uh, two distributions. You basically want to make this uh, generic and make it work for T bigger than one. And we, we actually um, said that, I actually said that the machine translation was originally approached with uh, more of a statistical methods where you focus really on the alignments. And in this case, one of the difficulties was that you have to actually have a training data that not only has the uh, input output pairs of the, um, the trans machine translation itself, but then you also need to have a phrase level alignment to make this model work. So that was the, this, the, the state of the art until 2014, when we saw the, the um, neural network coming into machine translation. And the first wave was this encoder decoder. And it's also called sequence to sequence or sick, sick to sick. And what they did is actually they used recurrent neural net on the input side, which is very, very, very similar to how you would do with the sentence classification. But then when people are using RNNs, 
it was not super clear how they can actually use that to generate something. Classification was straightforward because you can actually map the last hidden state into different classes, but generating something was not, was not so clear. And the idea here was that you can use the RNN to encode the input sentence into summary vector C, which is last hidden state of the RNN here. And you have another RNN where you create one word at a time. And when you're creating one word at a time, that's just classification, right? B-way classification. And you are, you think of that as an independent problem and you generate the second word given the first word, just like how we define, how we um, decompose the original P of Y given X into these uh, series of conditional probability distributions. And they used LSTM instead of GRU. No, I mean, they used our GRU instead of LSTM, which is um, defined next. But then before going into GRU, let's see how actually uh, recap how they use the RNN to create this encoder decoder network. So this side is very straightforward, right? It's very straightforward, same as how you did on your assignment. So, so really the difficulty is actually here, the decoder side, once given C. So as you see, you're, when you're computing the hidden state here, HT, so this will be H1. H1 is F of H0 comma YT, which in this case, um, actually, um, to be more exact. So back then the convention was that your, um, I mean, not convention, but then the, in the paper, they actually uh, define HT to be dependent on the previous hidden state and the previous input. So it doesn't really matter. Um, but then you can think of this as actually, it's it, in, in our terms, it's easier to think of this as HT is equal to HT minus one comma YT comma C. Then in that, in that sense, then, well, just looking at this part, it's just RNN, right? But then you have C. So there are several ways to incorporate C into this RNN. But then the best way is that you basically just define, you basically attach this C into YT, or you can attach that to HT minus one, which means concatenate. So um, either, either way should be fine. Actually, it has exactly same, um, it will have same implication because you're anyway using both H and Y to compute the um, next hidden state, right? Then this is just simple RNN, or you can use LSTM or you can use GRU. And then once you can define HT, really the importance here is that once you have defined HT, your next Y is just the um, output of, so this will be basically just, um, okay, yeah. I think I, I think I confused you, you a bit. So actually now I have to go back and then now tell you why it's YT minus one instead of YT again. I was a bit confused too. Okay, it's my bad. So here, um, when you are decoding, the important thing is that um, it's different from the encoder in, in, in the sense that the, you don't know what your first output will be, right? Because you're decoding, you're generating something. So what you do is you basically put, you, your first token will be Y0, which is something like start token that, that's actually telling you to start decoding. So it's actually, it's, it's actually correct that HT is equal to F of HT minus one and YT minus one and C. So which means H1 is equal to H0, which is a zero vector. And Y0, this is basically some special token that tells you that you have to start. And then you basically have a C. And then now this creates H1 and using H1, 
and then you use this with the um, um, the y t minus one and c, you have this uh, second function g, and this can be just simply oftentimes just uh, equal to just um, basically um, softmax of uh, ht. You can just ignore these two. In the original paper, I think they used both, but then uh, conceptually you can think of this as the current yt is just simply dependent on the, the current hidden state. And now you have this probability distribution in the vocab space of the output words. And now you, you basically then, you can predict the, the most likely word for y1, which is just argmax over t of p y um, You're choosing word among vocab space of y y one equal w given y zero and c, right? So you can just continue doing this during the decoding stage to decode it, and you can also um, train it by looking at this softmax probability and trying to match that to the target distribution, which is the label. And coming back to the GRU, or I mean, actually recapping the GRU, GRU, I told you that it's very similar to, similar to LSTM, except that it's a, a bit more, a, a bit simpler in a sense that it doesn't have, um, it only has a, actually, as you see, one gate instead of a three gates. Actually, my bad. So two gates, I mean. So we have two gates, right? We have Z and R. You remember that LSTM had three gates, input gate, forget gate, and output gate, but in GR you only have two gates. And they used two gates to actually control each vector, how much they should flow through. And you see that RT actually determines how much HT minus one should flow through which is kind of similar to forget gate. But then also Z is also actually um, controlling HT minus one again with the current candidate HT. So this is also similar to the um, forget gate, but there is no separate um, input gate because your input gate is simply just um, here in this case, the one minus of the forget gate. So they are basically conjugate, right? So I think it's been a, uh, actually, how long was it? Week, yeah, that we discussed this. But I think hopefully this is a good recap. I know it's a bit confusing that the decoding strategy is quite um, maybe difficult to understand. So let me know if you have any question, but now let's come back to the quiz answers, All right? So I'm gonna stop the um, quiz and save it. Can I save the quiz? I'm going to share the results. All right, so question number one. Most people said false. And what's the question? True or false? PY given X equal to blah, 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 does not hold true if Y3 is not independent of Y1 given Y2. And yes, the answer is false. Well, why? Why is it that? Because P of Y given X is always equal to this value, whatever the independence is. So this was actually a trick question. And what will be, how can we make this statement true? Well, this statement would have been true if we said 
more of a Markov assumption, what people call it. So it's like uh, um, your 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 um, certain probability only depends on the previous time step. So in if you're making the Markov assumption, then it's this this statement will be true. So it's something like this. Now P of uh, Y3 becomes different. So you see there Y1 is gone. So, and then you basically do that until P of YT and this is X given YT minus one. So this, if, we, if I said that, then this statement would be true. Oh, really? Yeah, I was writing, that's weird. What am I sharing then? Okay, I don't know why it didn't show up, but now you see it, right? So what I, what I wanted to say is that this statement would have been true if this was Markov, Markov assumption. And in this case, you're, Making a, such assumption when you have your de your dependency is in de independent of everything that comes before, given the the the. The previous um yeah why. Okay, so this is false. Number two. True or false, similarity to text classification and token classification, we can often compute the exact MLE loss for text generation. So most people said false and yes, it should be false. And I, I think I mentioned this too, that um, the MLE loss for text generation is almost impossible because of the, um, there are so many possible cases for the output space and you can like exactly compute the MLE loss for the entire text generation. It is possible that you can create the MLE loss for each independent token classic or token generation because this is only V way, but then um, you cannot compute the um, MLE just by combining these. It doesn't work that way. So it's um, if you're being mathematically very strict, then yeah, this is false. And finally, true or false, in quarter decoder, the input length does not have to be equal to the output length and the answer should be true, apparently, right? That's the whole point of uh, in quarter decoder. Okay, so great. I think most people got it right for each question. So I'm gonna stop sharing. All right, so, okay. <laughs> Typo, lecture 10. So we're gonna to move to lecture 10 and we're gonna actually discuss very briefly why, well, how we can train it. And you might be wondering, so how do we actually train these um, decoder? And actually a lot of complications come here because the how we train the decoder is like, we're training several models at the same time. Why is that so? Because as, as I've said, you, when you're predicting the first word, you're basically making that as a classification problem, right? That's very straightforward. But when you're uh, predicting the um, second word, well, that's also a classification problem, but then there is a dependency on the first classification's result, right? Because your second classification will depend on the first word. And the first word will be well, maybe it, can, it might be determined by the model. Then what if your first word is wrong? Then the, can you guess the second word right? And what does it mean during training? And what does it mean during inference? So there's uh, some complications going on, right? So it's really, really important to actually distinguish between the training time and the inference time because, well, during training, what happens if the next word prediction 
is wrong. I mean, what happens to next word prediction when the decoder's current time step prediction is wrong? So are we going to use the wrong prediction or the correct prediction? So option number one is that um, we can try to simulate the inference situation. We don't know which word is correct in inference. So we will have to feed the prediction, which was wrong. And then we use this as the input for the next word prediction. And this is called feed previous. Okay, so you might be confused what this means. So I'll co come back to this, um, this probability distribution we talk about. Let's just assume that we have just two words to predict, right? Very simple. It's the other way, I think. Okay. All right. So the there is no problem with this. Okay. This is very good. But the problem can happen here. This is the um, where the issues can happen. So, well, we model this and then we have this probability distribution for the first word. And we basically just um, choose one of them, right? We, we don't actually pass the probably we don't actually pass the probability distribution. So what we do is that just uh, we set um, y1 equal to argmax of that probability, um, making this space is too small. So um, what we do here is that y1 is equal to argmax of W in vocab space, where P of uh, W given uh, Y1 equal to W given X is maximized, which is basically just the result of the maximum likelihood estimation, right? Then we basically use this here. We just, just bring this to here. And then you try to predict Y2. But what if it's our Y1 is wrong? Then you're basically trying to predict Y2 with the wrong Y1. And we are because trying to solve this problem, this uh, second probability independently, well, then this problem better be good problem. But then if Y1 is wrong, then it's kind of ill-defined. So you might want, want to consider option two, which is we nevertheless feed the ground truth for the next word prediction, which is called teacher forcing. And I can tell you that the option two is usually preferred, but there is one, um, there are actually a few issues. And we're, we're gonna come back to the this in uh, two lectures, actually not two lectures, uh, next, next lecture, because I was supposed to cover this in the last lecture. But I didn't have time, so. But then that's, ex that, but then there is some benefit to the bit previous, the, the fact that actually, it actually simulates the inference situation. So actually, um, you know, it's based in the, um, in plain words, feed previous makes more sense in terms of uh, simulating the inference situation, which actually what, what's, which, which is what really matters, right? We're gonna come back to that. But the point here is that decoding is quite um, complicated in many cases. But there is a one bigger problem. And the problem really here is that, well, what people call bottleneck problem. And well, can you, we, had, we made a really important assumption in our previous slide in the encoder decoder, the fact that the vector C can contain the meaning of the whole sentence. But can we actually say that's really possible? Well, in order for encoder decoder to work, C has to contain the, all the information in the source sentence, right? Because that's the only time, that's the only way the decoder can know what the input is about. But then this means that we're going through a lot of compression. Why? For instance, let's say, suppose that the hidden state size of C is like 256. Then this means that um, you have a 25, six, 20, 256 numbers, 
But then suppose that T is um, 32. Well, then you have a 32 words. So can you contain the meaning of 32 words inside 256 dimensions of float, vec, uh, float values? Information theoretic, theoretically, this means then, well, how much information does one word um, carry? One word is just um, index in the vocab space. So suppose that your vocab is just for the simplicity, um, I would say um, vocab is uh, here um, 300K, okay? Um, 300K is too much, I think 100K, okay? So V is 100K. That means the information in each word can be considered as one out of 100K. And how many bits do you need to actually represent 100K? 100K is um, two to the power of time times um, times um, two to the power of uh, approximately um, eight, right? Because two to the power of eight is uh, 126. No, actually, <laughs> my bad. I mean, seven, right? Because uh, two to the power of six is 64. And two to the power of seven is 128. It is 256. Yep. So then, which means it's uh, 17 bits. And then you have uh, 32 words, which means then let's just say this is 16 bits, okay? Approximately 16 bits, which is half byte. Then basically, the information in the um, input sentence is actually around um, 16 bytes. Right? And how about the 256 float dimensions? Well, float, we can compress it to be 16 bit, so half byte. So this is actually 128 bytes, at least. So wait, is there really compression happening here? The input is like 16 bytes, but then you're mapping this to 128 bytes. So theoretically, actually, there is no reason to be able to compress the entire meaning of the sentence in such setup. Well, but then, um, wait, wait, I was a bit, wait, my, my bad. <laughs> okay, all right, 16 bit is actually two bytes, sorry. So um, I did the math a bit badly. So 16 bits is two bytes. So which means, um, this is 64 bytes. I mean, the conclusion is the same though, but um, because each um, word is worth of 16 bits and that's two bytes. And then you basically turn it into 64 bytes. How about the float points? Float is also two bytes. So it becomes 512 bytes, right? I mean, I'm talking about flow 16. It's a compressed version of flow 32. Then you're saying that like, okay, that's like a um, eight times increase in the size. So why is that you're saying it's compression? So in practice, this doesn't work well. Well, um, if you ask me why, there, is, there are several extra papers explaining why the um, um, vector compression doesn't work well, even, even though the information theoretically it should be possible. But um, the point is that um, this, there's a, this is a, a lot of bottleneck. And that's basically coming back to this, this um, famous saying from Ray Mooney that uh, you can cram the meaning of whole sentence into a single vector. Well, that's more of an empirical statement than theoretical because theoretical, theoretically, well, everything is a vector, right? But empirically, it doesn't work that way. So the idea here is then if instead of compressing everything, can we directly access the source sentence? And that's the really um, the motivation for attention mechanism that we're gonna actually um, cover this class, but we're gonna have a short break of five minutes. Um, I'm gonna see you at um, 4.45, see you soon.
Okay, welcome back. Now let's go into the exciting part of the um, sequence to sequence, which is attention. Okay, yeah. Well, I was assuming that the vector size is 26, 20, 250, 256 dimensions. And I was just assuming that each dimension is a float 16, which is 16 bit number. So typically when you are dealing with float values in GPU, you're actually gonna use float 32, which is full precision. But then I was assuming that the, maybe we can have a even smaller version of that, which is float 16, half precision. Then 16 bit is two bytes. So 256 dimensions times two bytes per dimension, which is 512 bytes. Is that clear? Okay. Let me know anytime. All right, so now let's get into what is what attention is. And to be more exact, we can think of this as uh, we're decoding with attention on the encoder side. And this is a seminal paper in 2015. Actually, um, you will see that it's coming from the same, um, some of the same authors. And well, what was the idea about was exactly tackling the issue of the bottleneck problem. So here, instead of summarizing the entire input into a single vector, we allow the decoder to directly access few relevant input tokens. So basically this is very similar to, um, well, memory accessing, but then the act of uh, the canonical memory access is non-differentiable, but we can, we can approximate it, the act, the act of accessing with soft attention mechanism for differentiability. And another way to look at this is that attention is a dynamic summarization per decoding step. So, in the original encoder decoder, what, what goes in here, what goes in here, this one, we call the C, right? And C was just a single static vector that was just output of this, um, the last hidden state of the RNN. But then instead of doing that, what we can do is we can compute, we can obtain C, different C for different time step. And that, C will depend on what the current decoder, the current time step of the decoder thinks uh, needs in terms of what kind of information it needs from the input sentence. And we want to obtain that by computing the weights for, for, for all the input, input tokens. Of course, uh, the output of the L, uh, LSTMs or GRUs, so, they are not actually coming from the word embeddings. So basically these alphas are the weights and here the T is for the decoding time step. And one, the second is the, um, they're actually measuring the time step for the encoder side. So basically um, alpha of uh, decoding time step T comma one means that it's uh, actually looking at the, how much the, at the time step T of the decoder you want to look at the first word of the input. And if we can suppose that these alpha values are defined for all Ts and for, for all um, um, input indexes, then we can say that, oh, we can then concretely uh, compute the, the dynamic C for each time step, right? So, more concretely. So we're gonna use I for the decoder time step. Actually, it's a bit actually quite confusing. The, this is actually coming from the original paper, but then you will see that they actually they're using the um, um, different notations very 
um, throughout. But um, J is for the, um, the encoder side. So we are defining the, the current time steps, C, the, um, the um, summarization vector or the context vector to be summation of all the outputs of the um, encoder side multiplied by the weight and summed. And this weight, um, note that the summation of um, alpha ij on the um, j side will be equal to what? 1.0, because it's a weighted average. So we don't want it to go over 1.0. Otherwise it will not be weighted average, right? So what if this value is evenly distributed? Then basically just um, equivalent to um, basically just um, summation of hj over, by the way, h are the vectors over these, the length of the input encoder, right? Which is Tx here. What if this is very spiky, which means the alpha is just alpha ij is 1.0 for only one of them. Then you, you're basically just retrieving that vector because you're gonna ignore all other vectors or retrieving that j uh, vector of h. That's why we sometimes call this is very similar to memory access because you're actually accessing the vector in the encoder side. And then now once, so how then, how, we do, how do we define alpha? Well, alpha is defined by, you are familiar with this equation, right? What do you call this? What is this equation? This is softmax, right? Yep, you're right. Good job. Okay, so it's called softmax. And whatever goes into softmax is usually um, coming from computation or, or some linear mapping and some um, go through some linear transformation with the parameters and also some, um, some activation. Um, in this case, each EI, EIJ is computed by A of uh, SI minus one and HJ. So what is here SI minus one? Well, SI minus one is exactly the previous time steps output in the decoder side. So when we are doing, we're computing this, we have already computed this one, right? ST minus one. So for some reason, the paper is actually uh, interchangeably using T and I, but you can think of this as, okay, you're computing S of T or S of I, then you actually, have already computed S of I minus one or T minus one. So you can still make use of that. And then you also access to this HJ, each uh, output in the input, I mean the each encoded vector on the input side. And then you're basically measuring um, affinity between them. Affinity is like uh, similarity, or um, you can think of that as um, some how, how much they are related. So in other words, you're basically computing how much is the current, the, I mean, the hidden state coming from the, the time step right before and the each hidden state from the input side is correlated. And that score will be, of course, um, will be um, just not bounded at all. It's just a real number. But then because they are going into this um, softmax, this alpha of i and ij will be strictly a valid probability distribution. Okay, then how do you have compute the affinity then, uh, the affinity, affinity score? Well, there are several ways, right? I mean, one, one easy way to actually compute the affinity score will be something like this. You multiply um, this to some matrix and then you multiply the HJ. 
that's one way to do that. And why haven't they done that? Well, actually, they maybe they haven't done that, but this is actually what um, Luong et al. in the same year did. So they are kind of concurrent work. So in their case, they actually they're almost everything else is same except for this affinity score, and they compute the affinity score to be this, and um, whereas the Badanao et al uses this, and people usually call it, um, this is a additive attention because you actually um, add, I'll show you what it means. Whereas they actually call this multiplicative attention. So in the additive case, well, what they do first is that they actually um, obtain SI minus one and HJ but instead of uh, using matrix to obtain a single value, I mean, matrix multiplication, they actually map each SI minus one and HJ to some vector space with uh, uh, different matrices, WA and UA. And then you actually do activation with 10H and then you do dot product with the, some other parameters. This is, so these are parameters. These are learnable parameters. Okay. Okay, so there, there was a question. Um, alphas are the outputs of RNNs. Um, then what is A? Is it the same thing just written different fonts or um, alpha and A are separate entities? Oh yeah, alpha and A are different actually. So alpha um, actually is a value and A is a function. Yeah, it's the notation here is pretty confusing, I agree. So alpha is actually, so if you go back to this, um, alpha is actually different from A. Alpha is actually a function of uh, whatever comes after A and also softmax. Is it clear? And alpha is not really output of the RNNs. Um, well, they're actually, um, well, yeah, I mean, they, are, they use the output of the encoder RNNs as um, basically, and also of course decoder RNNs as the input. Is it clear? How do they become about these mat matrices? Oh, these are the uh, learnable parameters. So they actually will be randomly initialized and you will train to actually um, obtain good values for these that optimize for the, of course, low, low loss. So these matrices are learnable parameters. They're not inputs. Is this clear? Yeah, so basically the intuition was that they're given SI minus one and then HJ and they want to compare between these two. So the easiest way to compare two vectors will be, well, actually even simpler one will be um, just actually dot product between them, right? So even simpler will be um, simplest, will be just maybe SI minus one, and HJ, this is dot product. But why didn't they do dot product? Well, if they do dot product, then they're losing some um, modeling, model, modeling power, right? Um, well, in that sense, then they have to always have, they have to be in the same inner product space, which can limit the modeling, um, well, capacity. So it's good to actually map one of them into another vector space or the same vector space because SI, SI minus one and HJ are actually their S is actually operating in the decoder space and H is operating in the encoder space. So we want to actually match those two vector spaces. So that's why there's this method which is about U S minus one transpose. Um, well, to be more exact. Um,
you basically map the decoder space, which is SI minus one, to um, encoder space with this W, and then do transpose, and then um, and then HJ. Well, what happens if you do this? Well, if you actually take the transpose out of it, then this, this just becomes S, S minus one transpose, um, W transpose and HJ. And W transpose just uh, because we're learning this, it's just equivalent to W. And actually, um, I actually had a, uh, this is my bad. This has to be transpose here. The, um, so this is equivalent. And then, but then some people thought that that's not enough. So what they do is that they instead um, try to measure the, uh, the similarity by uh, mapping SI minus one and HJ together to some vector space using this W and U. And then after that, they basically um, do dot product with these parameters to compute some score. So that was their, um, intuition and the spoiler is that actually people don't use this anymore. Yeah. Concat could compare it with others. Um, you mean the, what kind of concat? Mm. Oh, okay, yeah. Actually, um, so what you're saying is quite similar to this um, additive attention. So, because if you actually define W, the output space of W to be um, one, then basically this 10H this will be, the output, output dimension will be one, right? But then in that sense, then VA, the VA transpose, this will be just um, not used at all. So you can think of that um, concat being kind of a special case of um, this additive attention. All right, so basically this marks the uh, new era of NLP. Well, why is that? Machine translation was an important problem since 1950s. And as I've said, statistical machine translation was um, very dominant until 2015. And it was basically about learning a probabilistic model from word to word translation in training data or phrase to phrase alignment. And this SMT was extremely complex and involved lots of feature engineering. And this NMT, what we're talking about model-wise, it's only like a few hundred lines of code and very simple, very intuitive and fully data-driven, which meant if we just increase data size, then maybe it will just do better. And NMT became comparable to SMT in 2015, thanks to the attention mechanism that we, what we just discussed. And then it started to outperform with a large margin in 2016. So when, when it got to 2016, it was pretty clear that NMT worked better in 2015. And because we the NLP community knew how hard the SMT was, it was a very shocking thing that, okay, deep learning is a real thing. It's not just um, you know something that, uh, it's not a hype at all. So I actually uh, personally really observed this so in 2015, it was pretty clear that there are very few deep learning papers at NLP conferences. But then by 2016, like everyone realized that this uh, deep learning, um, well, attention or um, the sick to sick and also classification, they also created um, better ways to do it. This can be applied everywhere in NLP, not just um, classification, for instance. 
And just comparing the neural machine translation, um, well, the title is actually wrong. So what I was trying to say is that the, um, the SMT was pretty good until like 2016-ish. And when this um, NMT was first introduced, encoder decoder network was right here. But then when 2015, the attention mechanism was introduced cut about here. And then with some tuning, it was uh, people saw that there was a, some uh, cross point. And after that, as you have more data and as you have bigger model, um, you basically was actually extremely outperforming translation. I mean, the SMT. And it was good, but then there were a few issues. As I said, the, um, the decoding was not trivial. So um, training and inference are both tricky. And we're going to actually talk about this in the next class. But we actually covered one of the issues, which is about teacher forcing and the feed previous. There is a lot of complications coming here because the mathematically, the loss will not be, well, unbiased. It will be actually biased. That's the issue. And you have, um, well, the, in practice, people think that the, the unbiased loss is not too much a problem, but still mathematically, that's um, what actually annoys a lot of people. So there were, there were a lot of um, um, some tricks that were proposed after people have discovered that. And also there is an issue of beam search, which is also quite related to how this teacher forcing, how the um, decoder is being trained. Oh, and also actually, I mean, being, um, actually decoder is actually being used during inference time. We're gonna cover this in the next lecture. So because decoding is not a trivial problem. So we're gonna actually spend the entire lecture next week, next class, which is after next week, next week is midterm. And another thing is that the, um, we just used decoder, we just had the attention from decoder to encoder, right? Which is basically cross attention from the um, output side to the input side. But then it's also, it's actually relying on an assumption that the encoder is able to contextualize the input pretty well with the bidirectional LSTM or GRU. Which is, we know that this is not necessarily true when the length of the input becomes pretty long, right? Um, so can we do better than um, that? And also, can we do, uh, can we actually do something better than the Badanao's attention or Luong's attention? And after all, that actually also led to a question, can we also get away with this recurrent neural net because this is so super slow? when you're using GPU, they are not parallelizable, especially on the encoder side. And in fact, because of these issues, um, whether the people really intended to dissolve this everything at once or not, um, it was actually pretty clear by 2017 that attention only, or just using the attention is able to resolve all these issues at once. And um, the, the spoiler here is that the model is called um, transformer, which became the basically the bedrock for the modern NLP. And we're gonna cover this actually uh, lecture uh, the in lecture twelve. So today's lecture was lecture ten. Next lecture lecture eleven, and lecture twelve will be covering transformer. And when we are when we get to transformer, we're gonna cover also uh, a bit of language model, but then that will actually conclude the first part of this class, which is what, what I call pre-birth era until 2017. And we're gonna have a um, short, um, well, kind of celebration by having a discussion session that you will be actually required to come to get um, some grades, but the grade will be pretty lenient as long as you, you are actually involved in these discussions. So we're gonna actually go over the papers that we discussed throughout the first half of the semester. And then you're gonna actually try to answer a few questions that actually have um, some food for thoughts. So I think it's a good thing that actually I made this in time. So I'm gonna actually go for a short poll, which I think I forgot to do last time, but then this time I'll make sure to do so. trying to see 
how the lecture was today. All right, so could you please quickly participate in this poll? I'll leave it open for one minute. It will be helpful for me to paste the class and um, By the way, your assignment three will be based on the sequence to sequence using transformer, very likely to be. So, um, well, not the um, the original sequence to sequence though. So um, probably next, next lecture, not next lecture, but the lecture after that, lecture 12 will be very important for assignment two, assignment three. Okay, thanks for your poll. I'll just share it with you. So um, I think, yeah, more people are having some issues. It's good that at least that not every not uh, at the majority is not having trouble, but anyways, yeah. I'm gonna share that. Um, just for the reference. All right. Okay. So thanks a lot for um, your attendance today. So next week, again, we don't have lectures. I'm going to see you a week after that. So have a good midterm and see you in approximately two weeks. Thanks, everyone.